Hello, welcome to the podcast. We have Dr. Amy Beheimer here. She is a farm D. She is a coach and she does really amazing work in the realm of autoimmunity. So I want to welcome you, Amy. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me, Delane. I'm so excited to be here. So I want you to introduce yourself as far as your training, like explain your training, not just your farm D. I think most people are familiar with that, although I love to hear about that stuff too, but I also want to hear about your coach training. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. My um, doctor of doctorate of pharmacy came from University of Georgia. That's been almost 20 years ago. So um, a huge part of who I am, how I see the world, um, definitely the strengths I bring to uh, the work that I'm doing with autoimmunity and, and helping people. But more recently, I, you know, have started, or I have put on this identity as a coach and really leaning into the power of coaching and how coaches can change the world, change our health, change our life. Um, specifically, I went for training in functional medicine coaching so nice. really looking at the root of what uh, is going wrong in our bodies. And I have to say, I found it mainly because I started looking for myself, which I'm sure we'll get into, you know, the various things that my body has been telling me over the years, but going the functional medicine route through coaching and then getting uh, board certified through the National Board of Health and Wellness Coaching has just been huge um, in terms of the skill set and the ability to really help people change. Uh, so combining those two skill sets, the the science and the conventional medicine with this functional medicine behavior change piece has just been um, such a gift. Yeah, yeah. I know that for those of us who work within the Western medicine realm, and then we have this other part that really does combine the why do we need to change and how do we make powerful lifelong changes in our life when we, I mean, cause Western medicine does not teach yeah. that. I mean, really, really falls short in that category. And I think that, yeah, we start to see, and when, when we see how do you create long lasting change and then we see it in our own lives and then we see, we can share it with others. It is just, I, you know, for me, like it's true hope, like, oh yes. my gosh, I see that this is possible and everybody else in the world needs to see it's possible. And it's really what's missing from medicine. Most people in Western medicine, most providers are like, yeah, nobody can make lifelong changes. Let's just give them a med. Yeah. And it's, it's a very, um, it's, it's a disheartening at best, yeah. uh, mindset. And so, yeah, I, I agree with you. Like this is really what changes people's yeah. lives and it's such meaningful work. So, yeah. Well, and it's such a snowball effect. And I, I often find that it just takes people being curious enough and hopeful enough that maybe there is a different way to get over that initial hump of, Ooh, I'm going to see what it's like to work with a coach and then yeah. you start to really experience it. And then it's like, oh, I don't need to read about what a coach can do. Like I'm, I'm here feeling it. And like, that's where the magic is. If we can overcome ourselves to try something different. Yes. Yes. And I think that it is, it is truly where the magic. And I think that some people are able to get there in that hope phase, yeah. but I think also equally as powerful as those people who are in that desperate phase and they're like almost to their wits end. And they're like, I don't know what else to do. These meds are what they say is going to help. In my brain, it's like, give yourself every fighting chance that you can and take this leap for yourself before you give up that hope, you know? Oh my God. I love that. I, I just, yeah. um, two days ago I was, I had, was meeting with a client and he, I just love when they use words that I'm like, that is genius. But he said, you know, in recapping kind of what we were doing, he goes, I just love it. Cause I, I leave you. And I know that I have no regrets. I will have no regrets. Yeah. At the yes. End that I didn't yes. try everything and give myself yes. the best shot. And I'm like, I couldn't agree more. It's no yeah. regrets. Let's, let's do this. Well, yeah, exactly. I love it. That's amazing. So yeah. So tell me, tell us about your coaching practice. I love this. I love what you do. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I help people with autoimmune disease really take control of their health so that not only can they start feeling better today, because 
chances are, if you have an autoimmune diagnosis, you're feeling a bit like crap, whether it's low energy, whether it's symptoms related to whatever the diagnosis is. So you feel bad today, but then you have this added element where you worry about tomorrow because with an autoimmune diagnosis comes, is it going to progress? Am I going to have another one? What does this mean for my health? And so that taking control of your health includes both the inner work of what it takes to take control of your health. That's a lot of that coaching, the our beliefs and how we're feeling and how that drives what we do. And then the outer work, what are the habits that you're actually putting into place to change your biology and to make those changes and feel those changes? Yeah. Yeah. Abs- that's so amazing. So tell how did you get into this? I know this backstory, but I want you to share your path into this work with autoimmunity. Absolutely. I started, um, I was 17. I was diagnosed with vitiligo. So that was what I call my gateway uh, autoimmune disease. It's on the skin. It's solely, you know, vanity. It, it doesn't really cause any harm other than white patches. You know, as a 17 year old, it can sometimes feel like it's harmful when you're, when your face looks different, but had vitiligo. Um, I kept going, didn't change much about my standard American diet, the way I lived, the way I moved. Um, In my mid twenties, I was diagnosed with Graves autoimmune thyroid disease. Mm -hmm. So now I'm on number two. Um, I'm already through pharmacy school at this point. So I get a little red flag, like, Ooh, something is not right. You know, is there another diagnosis coming? I started getting that worry piece. So when I talk about Mm. that second piece of worrying what's next, that's where that started was, was with the Graves disease. Um, at the time I took a medicine that, um, put it into remission and kind of kept going. And a few years later, when I was 27, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Wow. Wow. So really back to back, back to back. Yes. And, and I've even had a fourth diagnosis in there, um, an IBD, an inflammatory bowel disease Sure, sure. that, um, you know, I didn't have as many symptoms with, and, and I'm so grateful that three out of four of those are in remission and there's no evidence of those in my body. Uh, I do have, you know, multiple sclerosis and I live with, you know, the symptoms that come with that today. But when I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, it was, it was just, a wake up call. It was sure. sure. I know a lot about this human body and through my training. And it's not only whispering to me, it is screaming at me that, you know, something needs to change. And when my mobility and my independence and my ability to walk, um, kind of came at, you know, started to be threatened. That's when I was like, Whoa, what am I going to do different? How am I going to change my lifestyle? Yeah. That's amazing. It's amazing that three out of four of those that you've put into remission, essentially. You know, it's, it's the power of this work. It's been, you know, about 12 years that I really started looking at what are the things I'm doing? What are the things in my control? What can I influence? Um, so it's been, like I said, almost 12 years. And I think that's just the power of our bodies and the ability for them to you know, get back on course. They want to, they want to serve us and they want to heal. We just have to give them the building blocks they need Mm -hmm. to do it over a Mm -hmm. long period of time. It's, it's a long game. Yeah, absolutely. So sure. Like your general, I'm interested in hearing you on your general philosophy of these causes of autoimmunity and then into kind of the six prong approach that you teach. Sure. So, you know, I, I love, to first start with the analogy that most of your listeners and you have probably heard of, you know, that our genes are load the gun and environment pulls the trigger. Yes. Yeah. And so we have these, this genetic predisposition to have an autoimmune disease and something happens in our environment that pulls the trigger. And the reason that I don't love that analogy and have had to find a new one that serves is that that makes it seem like it's a one and done thing. Like we have a diagnosis and and that's it. And the truth is not only does our environment and by environment, I mean our lifestyle and our habits, not only does that um, impact, 
yes, getting a diagnosis, but it also impacts the prognosis, how we feel with that diagnosis, how fast that diagnosis progresses. You know, do we change anything at the root of what caused it? And so the analogy that I love more is think of a piano and Mm. a piano has a set number of keys. Those are our genes. They are fixed. They are constant, but you can come up to that piano. You can play it at a different tempo, a different rhythm, a different volume. And the music that comes out of that piano is going to be very different. It's going to sound very different. And so that's, that's how we need to think about this is that we are playing the piano with our habits, with our lifestyle, with our environment, and we get to determine the music that comes out of it. And so with that, you know, when you ask about what my approach is, my approach is how do we optimize our habits and our lifestyle in every way possible so that we love hearing the music that comes out? Yeah. Yeah. I love that analogy, by the way. Yeah. You like that? Yeah. Oh, I I do. I love it. It's brilliant. It's a spin on a few different, you know, everything that we, we hear, you know, we're influenced by different people. And, you know, if you're like me, you're reading and listening and, you know, devouring all this information. And so, um, you know, from that, I have come up with my framework for what those different lifestyle and habits, how those all fit together, because we need a framework to help ground us in what are the, all the various things that we can be doing and that we're doing and how does it all relate back to our, our total health? And so the framework is called the habit hub for autoimmune health. And I can run through what the six spokes of the habit yes, hub are. Okay. Please. And like I, and we'll probably dive into each of them, but at the top of the, um, what I call spoke one is mindset matters. So mm-hmm. again, that inner work, that spirit of health of how we are thinking and feeling about our health that sets up the rest. Um, the second spoke is food as medicine. So likely everybody listening, if they are in your world for a second, knows that yes. food has the power to harm and the power to heal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, number three is movement as medicine. So how do we move these bodies in big and little ways to help um, help them heal? The fourth one is rest and relaxation. So that's everything related to sleep and how we handle stress. Mm-hmm. Fifth is my favorite connection, how we um, are wired to belong and how we, how we make the most of that. And then the last one is one that we don't hear about quite as much, but is so crucial with autoimmune disease is what I call the good stress. So Mm. that those are the things that we're doing where on purpose, we are pushing ourselves a little bit past our comfort zone into our growth zone so that we get to come out the other side, just a little bit stronger and a little bit more resilient. I love that. I love that. I've been looking into sauna work. I've kind of come mm. in and out of hanging, you know, of like of sauna work and just, and of course it's cold right now. It's in the winter, so it's easy to get in the sauna. Um, and that whole idea of the stressing of your body yep. leading to an improvement in overall well being and health. And that that's really how sauna works. And so um, I think that that you're right. It is something that we don't, I mean, everyone's like, I think as humans, we're driven to look for the easiest path possible. And so, you know, sometimes it doesn't seem to be, uh, to make sense to look for that stressor, but the good stress that is relevant and helpful to building health. Well, and we all know it with weights. I mean, we go to the gym, we know that we're going to be sore. And it's like, oh, but this is good. This is, I come back, I'm stronger. And so we take that same principle, we apply it to what we do to our cells metabolically, kind of how you mentioned with sauna or various types of fasting, but we also can do that with our emotions. We absolutely lean, lean into and feel a little discomfort or angst or whatever it is and, you know, get that rep of, oh, I can handle that. And I, and I didn't die. Yeah, it's resilience, really. I mean, both like with the muscle part of it, it's resilience. The more we prove to ourselves that that isn't going to be the end of it, the more we prove to ourselves we can do more. It's, it's, it, that's, you're right. It is the one that nobody talks about, but really so yeah. very powerful. Yeah. And there's these so, six, oh, there's these no, six folks. I, I was just going to say, you know, it's, it's usually habits and lifestyle have a primary spoke that they fall under, but, 
it they really are so interconnected. You know, you can be absolutely trying to cut down on processed foods. I know is important for both of our audiences, but so that can fall under food as medicine, but you may have to feel some discomfort as you resist an urge to do it. So that's going to dip over into the good stress spoke. So the beauty of the habit hub for autoimmune health is that they all kind of play together and, you know, finding balance amongst them is, is key because you know, I had a time where I was so focused on food as medicine that I was not going out to dinner with friends because I didn't want to eat the inflammatory yes. oil. And I yes. finally, I'm like, whoa, I'm I'm sacrificing one spoke for another. Yes. And so seeing it big picture really does help. Or the people who, and I've been this person like, oh, I only got five and a half hours of sleep, but I got to get up for my workout, right? Exactly. And the realization that like, yeah, you can't like that. I mean, maybe once in a while you can do that, but we cannot consistently be making that sacrifice, that trade off. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that. So I know we talked and I really do love this idea, you know, even the piano being the genes and the way we play it being kind of the, the part the, that we have, um, you know, the nurture versus nature we have, we have nature that needs to be nurtured. You and I have talked about this in the past and I like yes. that. Um, so when you work, I mean, do you find that in your coaching practice that you hear people coming to you with this very defeated idea? Like these are just my genes and I've got nothing to do. Like, I don't know that there's anything I can do to change it. And no. Yeah. What's a story? I mean, what's the message that you hope those people I'm, here. You know, I'm trying to reach more people who are in that phase. I'm trying to instill the belief that what we do matters. Cuz you know, by the time somebody is you know curious enough to reach out to me to have a conversation about, you know, can we work together, they they have a belief that, you know, it, they often have yes. maybe seen, it, seen it in someone else or they have some sort of belief and so it really is. There are so many people, I think, more that I come across in my personal life that, you know, they have an autoimmune diagnosis and they are like me with my first two diagnoses where, okay, not all right, not much I can do, or I'll take the pill, I'll do this. And so really realizing that we don't need to wait for that, for it to be a diagnosis that feels earth shattering or for it to be so bad that we need to see such a change. If we can get upstream and make some of these changes in a way that feels really good and look at it as a gift you give yourself to work with a coach instead of this yes. have to do or punishment. Right. Like I just, I, um, I just, I, you know, but like I said, I was, I was in that boat too. Sure. I yeah. think that once we see and we work through some of these struggles in our own lives that we felt like we're out of our control or we didn't know how to get control of, or we're not seeing any good examples of people getting, when we get to the other side and we're like, oh yeah, this is, this is, I've mastered this. I know how to control this. I know exactly what to do. I know where to change things when things need to be changed. I think when we get to that place, we all, there's, I mean, I think it's very natural to be like, man, I wish I would have known this earlier. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, what would have been different in life? And so I do think, you know, I like, we want that, you know, Oh, let me help you. I hope you can find it earlier. I find this with my children. I'm constantly like, man, and I had this mentality earlier, totally. boy, I would totally. have taken over the world and I want this for you. I want you to be able to have that. So I do. Yeah. yeah, I get that. And I agree with you. I'm in that same boat where I'm constantly trying to get the word out there. You do not have to live sick. Yeah. You do or not have to live sick remove the disease from it and just ask right. any human being, like, what do you do? What do you wish you were doing that you just can't seem to, to do? And, and everybody has something. Oh, I wish yes. I ate better. I wish I moved more. I wish I stressed less. That is the, the gift of that coaching can bring is the ability to decide on something you want and go out there and get it yeah. and, and do it in a way that you love and it feels good. And, you know, the, um, there's a Harvard study that shows the three macronutrients of happiness. And oh. I love the, 
the wording they use because it speaks to us as food as medicine. But I like to say, I borrow it and say it's the three macronutrients of health because for how many of us is health directly tied to our happiness? Yes. If we don't feel healthy, it sure is hard to feel happy. But one of And the- if you are healthy without happiness, what the hell is the point? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? Exactly. Oh God, that's so true. Yeah. Um, what but- are those three? I want to hear those. So the three, one, I mean, they're, they're ones you've heard before. One is like a sense of meaning or a sense of purpose, which mm-hmm. absolutely coaching can help. Two is pleasure. Most people don't have problem really um, doing things that feel good, doing the day-to-day. Um, some people have a problem doing it in a way where they just enjoy it and don't make themselves feel bad for it. But the second one is pleasure. And the third one, and the reason why I think that everybody who wants a coach should have one is its progress, its mm. satisfaction. It is the daily nice daily bit of I'm making progress towards a goal. Mm, And, you know, I think, yeah, I think sometimes we think, well, if I, I, I only would have a goal if something's wrong. It's like, no, having a goal is what it means to be alive and to go for it. So, um, so yeah, so that would be the, that progress piece, that satisfaction in doing what you say you want to do. Yeah, that is so, Yeah. Absolutely. And I've never thought about progress as being a part of that. That's amazing. So, I mean, progress clearly is important, but I've never thought of that as one of those kind of key components. Yeah. So that's, yeah, I love that. So let's discuss a little bit the three, like maybe if you can narrow it down to three, which might be hard, but um, most common autoimmune diseases that you work with um, or maybe... I don't know. I I know you probably, and you've said this, that you work a lot with MS folks. Um, And how, but more, how do you apply the, and maybe it's the same across the way, six prong approach to various autoimmune. I know you and I have spoken, and I don't know that I've shared this on the podcast, not intentionally keeping it. It just doesn't come up, but um, rheumatoid arthritis is very prevalent in my family. My grandmother was diagnosed and legally um, handicapped. That was the legal term back then. By the time she was 35, um, she had all of the impressive, like pharmacology, like she had gold injections, certainly methotrexate. She had all sorts of, um, therapies that we don't even use anymore. And of course in the 1960s, when she was diagnosed, they were on this joint conserving mentality for rheumatoid arthritis. So they told them not to move. That was their biggest, that was their, the, like the, at least my understanding of the key, um, you know, river running through their, uh, recommendations for treatment was to conserve joints and not move. Um, so that was my grandmother. So of course, by the time I was born, my grandmother was very crippled, had many, many joints fused, had all of the physical deformities that come with horrifying rheumatoid as it was before we had really good, well, better therapies. Um, she was an amazing human being whom I just have such deep, deep gratitude that she was in my life as long as she was. And she taught me many important things. And she just, the the joy and the, um, just her entire demeanor. She was just joyful in spite of significant pain because you know, she was in significant pain all the time. So, um, that was my first, you know, experience with rheumatoid. And I don't think that I realized in my teen years, how familial it was until my mother came down with her diagnosis when Mm -hmm. I was in medical school. All right. As well. Oh, Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh, wait, wait, now hold the phone. What are we doing here? You know, yeah. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. And so um, certainly, and my mom's, of course, I mean, she's in her seventies now and she's had a much less painful life, maybe better treatment therapies um, than my grandmother had. But of course that is always in the back of my head. Like, and yeah. and so I think I have a special um, place in my, in my heart for room or for uh, autoimmunity, partly because there's a part of me in the back of my head that I'm like, this could be yeah. on my horizon someday. Yeah. So, um, so I would love to hear the way that you apply your six prong approach sure. to all the, the variety of these. Well, and you're so like, we pay attention to what 
impacts us. So, you know, you have these two strong, beautiful women who were impacted by this. So of course you're like on the lookout for yeah. what else. And that's going to be more and more with stats are almost one in five having an autoimmune disease, Americans, and wow. another tens of millions with these antibodies as precursors. Yes. And so, yeah. um, and I, and I promise I will answer your question, but sure, I sure. want to say your grandma, um, you know, I remember one of my first coaches, she pulled out of me that what I really wanted was for my nieces, my nieces and nephews to look back and be like, list all these things about their aunt Amy. And I wanted autoimmune disease to be like, oh yeah. And she had MS and she had autoimmune disease versus for a while I was stuck in this, this is, you know, impacting my life in all the negative ways. And this is, you know, mm. going to make this worse. And so your grandma almost pre-coaching had the wisdom wow. and to say, you know, you're not going to rob me of my joy, which is yeah. so inspirational. Yeah. yeah. She was really, really an amazing, an amazing woman. So yeah, but Aww, and I'm thanks like, for sharing. I needed help. To yeah. be, I needed help to get there. So she, she was, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm own. like grateful. Whatever her genes are that I got in me, even if they do have yeah. rheumatoid with them, I'm like, I'm grateful I have them. Yeah. She was a pretty amazing lady. So, yeah. So yeah. So, so the, the, the people that I work with, I, I, like I said, a like attracts like, or misery loves company. So, um, I do <laughs> find that people with MS do find their way to me. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that. Um, also there's a lot of co, um, diseases cause they do tend to cluster. So thyroid disease is statistically one of the top ones. You know, if you don't have, um, some sort of thyroid issue, chances are, you know, somebody who does, you know, I hate mm -hmm. to say that, but Truth, thyroid, yeah. rheumatoid arthritis, um, another one that is questionable, the autoimmunity, autoimmunity link, but Lyme's disease so mm -hmm. people will come because again, they're in that place where they just feel terrible and what can they do? And the commonality there is a lack of energy. It's the, the, the symptom that binds a lot is what's going on at a biochemical level is, you know, our cells are not as strong They're The mitochondria are damaged. And so yes. we just feel fatigued and exhausted and, you know, it doesn't matter what the, what is, you know, the work that I do with people is all about let's make these cells the healthiest they can be. Let's work on our minds. Let's work on our bodies. Um, and the approach really is we have these habits to work on, but it's first really getting clear on what where you feel stuck. Is it you don't know what to do? Is it you don't quite understand why it matters or why you really, it's worth it to you? Or for most people, you just don't know how. So you may come with I know exactly what I want to be doing, but how in the world do I actually do it? So it's really getting specific first with what, where in that, what, why, how do you feel stuck? And then we work together until we, till we make progress and we reach big goals and then we get to pick new ones and, and from a place of love. Yeah. And so on that six prong approach, I imagine, as you're saying that kind of looking at their goals at your client's goals, yep. um, probably dictates which one of those prongs that you heavily lean on. Absolutely. Usually, you know, the, yeah. the, uh, BJ Fogg, I don't know if you're, if your listeners are habit lovers, but he is one of the leading researchers in habits. Does he have a book? He does T tiny habits. There we go. Okay. Yes. I know his book. I have not read it, but I know his book. Tiny habits. And he says there are two maxims to behavior change. One is we need to do what we want to do and mm. we need to feel good while we're doing it. So when people come in, A, where do you want to start? Where yes. do you want to start? Because get it, making progress where we want to start is key. And then another thing is I do something called um, an energy audit and we really go mm. through each of those six areas, we really dig in, where's your biggest bang for your buck going to be? Because maybe you have the most room to make some progress. So between those two things, it usually becomes pretty clear on where we start. And you and I know it doesn't matter where you start because you're building the skill of, yes. of making and breaking habits. So of starting, of starting, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're building the skill of starting. Yeah. 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 That's and that'll awesome. transfer over to, to whatever we want to work on. 
So I know you have a six keys, six key habits to feeling better today. And I want to come back to that. But before we do, I want to talk about you and I have spoken about this briefly, and I really would love to talk about it for an hour, but that seems excessive. So we don't have to do that right now, but I want to talk about your sugar snob idea, which I think is brilliant. And I do want to hear your 10 cents on where artificial sweeteners fit into autoimmunity and like, um, just the cause I think a lot of times we as humans love sugar and that Mm -hmm. is just biochemistry. Like nothing's broken about us. There's nothing wrong with us. We're not addicted to it any more than we would be addicted to other things that we didn't naturally come into contact with that has this biochemical experience. So, um, I think that humans, we like to find our sweetness everywhere. And when we believe that the sugar is a problem, then we turn to something else to try to get that sweetness. And that turns us to, of course, artificial sweeteners, but I want to hear your 10 cents on being a sugar snob. Cause I think we have similar ideas on this. And then I do want to hear you, um, yeah explain the artificial sweeteners and where it keeps us stuck. I would love that. So I, of course, for, you know, a podcast that has diabetes in the name, we're going to, we're going to talk about sugar. It it really started with people would describe, as I was starting to experiment with how am I going to be eating, you know, all those years ago, people around me watching, you know, they would say, oh, she doesn't eat sugar. Oh, she, because, because they would notice that I wasn't going after the big desserts. I wasn't doing various things. And, and for some reason, like that label, it wasn't entirely accurate. And it kind of made it seem like I was doing something that, you know, that was hard to do, or, you know, she doesn't do sugar. And so really what it means, and and I have a podcast episode on this, which is what you're referring to. It's the habit of being a sugar snob, what it, you know, a snob by definition is like being selective and being you know, intentional to kind of have high standards for something. And so being a sugar snob essentially means, and I invite everybody to be a sugar snob with me. It means if I'm going to eat sugar, it's going to be worth it. Like it's not going to be from a package that I could get at any convenience store anytime that is just, there's so many of them that it, you know, it's everywhere. You know, it's not going to be this just mindless eating in a fog, or um, it's going to be on purpose. It's going to be someone I love made me a gluten-free, dairy-free dessert. And, you know, and I want to try it, or it's going to be because I spent time in the kitchen cooking something for my celiac husband or for, you know, someone else I love. So yeah, it's really just that, that redefining that we can have it, but let's make it worth it. Let's make it um, exclusive and really like worth what it, you know, potentially can do to our body. And when, when we do it in that way, remarkably, it doesn't have as, you know, catastrophic of an effect on our body. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I also like the idea, you know, of if it's something you can get everywhere, yeah, you've already had it in your lifetime. Yeah. And chances are, it's not that spectacular or not as spectacular as it could be. Yeah. Right. One of my, one of my ways to be a sugar snob that I talk about is I've decided if there's any chance that somebody was sitting in a meeting in a boardroom and they're on a team of executives that are, that are designed to help you crave something more or to make something have a certain mouthfeel so that you can't stop. I've decided I'm pissed off enough at that concept Yes. That you don't, you don't go in my body. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. just, and it's I, a solid no. <laughs> I'm a solid no. If, if somebody in a boardroom decided this, then I'm out. I, I'm not doing and it. this. My mindset on that gets a little hippy dippy and that's okay. I'm a little like hippy dippy. I'm all right with that. Mm-hmm. But this idea about food being made with love and how that love that we make food with, and, and I totally, I totally harness this. I always tell my children, anything I make for them is chucked full of love. I Mama love made you an omelet and it's chucked full of love, right? I love that. Yes. But having the food and the love that goes into the preparation of food 
and how that transmit to the consumers. And I'll tell you, those people in that damn boardroom, making sure the mouthfeel and the bliss point and all of it that is made in the food that they are manufacturing for the yep. millions, yep. they don't care two shits. Of sense, but they don't they're have any love it. for me. They are they're eating not it eating because it. They, they don't because they no. know how horrible it is. Yes. Exactly. And so, yeah, like, absolutely. I yeah. love that. That and, and I, the same way, once I realized that that was what was happening with packaged and, and yep. processed foods that it was about how they could make you you the consumer want it so much that you would eat it regardless of how good it was and how sick yep. it makes you yeah when I realized those two things it became very easy to break up with sugar for me at least and so. if you're still out if you're still in that like nothing is wrong with you that no. is I, I still um it's so funny what you said about you've eaten enough of it I have yeah. eaten enough perfectly milk soaked Oreos to know the way that feels when it dissolves in my mouth and I squeeze out the milk. Mm -hmm. I can I can sit here. I haven't had an Oreo probably in, I don't know, almost a decade. And I can and still feel it. Yep. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yep. I remember you. I love you. You got me through some very Our broke times. days. Some yeah. very broke days where I bought you the knockoff version at the dollar store in my college town, you know, yes. that, that kind of thing. So, um, oh yes. And, and artificial sweeteners, you know, it's hard for me to, to, um, I'm going to give you my personal experience yeah. with them that led, that leads into kind of the science behind it. But I used to be addicted to diet Coke, meaning uh, yeah. Yeah. Delane's raising You're my hand. sister from another mister. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> like, I'm talking 10, 12 a day. Um, yeah. I have a quit date. I know the exact mm. quit diet Coke on May 3rd, 2013, my last one. It. And, um, so I remember feeling poisoned sometimes. I remember getting to the point where I felt like something was, and it was, you know, because I was cracking my 13th one of the day. And so I think that there's a lot of danger and so many people want to say, well, it's not proven. It's like, well, why do we need to wait for something that, why do we need to wait for this evidence when there's a lot of signs pointing to how much destruction it has on our body, these mm -hmm. insert whatever artificial sweetener it is. It's called artificial. Like your body doesn't recognize it as a food and mm -hmm. your body is having to process it. Your body is using its precious energy. And the biggest, you know, science-backed reason of late that I really get behind is what it does to our gut microbiome. Yeah, mine. That's what I understand. That's my understanding also. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's the 70% of our immune system is in our gut. And so if we are trying to create autoimmune health, which is the, mm. the call to action that I empower everybody, let's become autoimmune health creators instead of just managing a disease, let's create health. Yes. Um, our gut has to be at the center of it. And, you know, if we're, if we're coming in and wiping out the good stuff that we do in all these other areas for something like that, um, you know, it's doesn't quite make sense, but I yeah, know it's it hard. Seems like it's you're, so hard. We're riding the gas and the brake together. And no, I agree with you as far as your thought, the comment, like nobody's broken. If this is what you're doing in my brain, I'm like, yeah, no. The food manufacturers spend millions of dollars every year to research yeah. and develop food that hijacks your neurochemistry yeah. so that you want it. There yeah. is nothing wrong with you. You're working perfectly the way the human body is meant to work. We have to realize what's happening and kind of have this intentionality and this rising above that neurochemistry to stop that part and get you it to six states. Oh, you're so right. You want to hear hippy dippy? I yeah. have a recurring dream that I decide in my dream, screw it. I want diet Coke again. And I just start drinking diet Coke. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And I wake up and I'm like, did I drink a diet Coke? Did I, this, what, this what is happened? how a true diet Coke addict works. Yes, I get it. And I was there. I yeah. was there. Yeah. I totally get it. Did you uh, rank, did you rank can versus bottle versus? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. Totally. Bottles were su like far inferior to me. I think cans were probably superior and then the fountain drink was tolerable and I would do okay with it. That's my, oh, I loved fountain. Fountain was mm -hmm. my, um, fountain was my jam. Did you rank them between fast food restaurants? McDonald's number one. Yeah. yeah Always. Yeah. They have big straws. And I think that I know. So you can get a lot more. down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come more 
work with us and we can, we can really understand you. That's what I'm getting. We, we only Absolutely. learn through experience, right? This is Absolutely. real. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I love this. So my question that I always ask people who are on the podcast, what is the one thing, if you felt there was one thing that a human being could do to get the most bang for their buck, as far as their health goes, what would that one thing be? I kind of have two answers. <laughs> We'll okay, well, this because this one doesn't really. I mean, this one's a little bit different, but I, I think starting today and mm, meaning, I love that. Like whatever, you know. How true is that? Whatever BS what? your brain wants to tell you about waiting, or it'll get easier, or I'll do it when. Like yeah. the compound effect, the compound interest of starting so small today and making progress. Back to that progress thing. You will never, ever, ever regret it. Yeah. Figuring out how to start today. I think um, that's great. Yeah, I don't mean I don't need my second one then. Uh, my I love my second... it. I do. I'm like I mean like you can say it, but I think that you're right. Starting <laughs> today is the biggest thing that you can do for your health. I love that. I think my second one, you know, is just the one that I can't. It's what changed my life was really embracing my thoughts about my disease, mm-hmm. about my diagnosis and realizing they're optional. And, you know, that, that mindset work of, I thought when I was diagnosed, my life would always be worse. Like there is no way mm-hmm. you can have a progressive chronic neurodegenerative disease and not have a worse life. And slowly over, a, over a decade, like slowly chipping away at that. And now I, I true again, starting then and slowly doing the work with the help of, you know, outsider help. I don't believe that anymore. Like that I can look back and say, no, I don't like, I refuse to say my life is going to be worse because of a diagnosis. So, uh, so mindset doing something to invest in. I love that. The mindset work. Yeah. And I love that you said that, that thoughts are optional. We Uh, just, in the group, I have a, my, my group program, we meet on Fridays we meet on Tuesdays and Fridays and Tuesday we met and we kind of had this conversation and, and me and one of my clients, we were like, well, you know, you don't have to feel this way forever. And she's like, I know you keep saying that, but how do I stop? (laughs) So on Friday I was like, oh, we need to talk about that. But just the knowledge that the things that we think, sometimes things pop into our head and we can't control every time what what yep. pops into our head, but we can control. It is yeah. optional to continue to spend time with those thoughts that feel cruddy. It is yes. optional to continue to believe that life is going to be worse, which feels worse, which feels yep. that is optional. And yeah. when we realize that and then, you know, working with somebody, it gives you the opportunity to develop something else that's also true, right? Like, yes. and start to spend more time with those thoughts. And that's how we change yes. our lives, period. Well, and I love that woman because go back to the, where am I stuck? What, why, or how? Okay. So she kind of knew, okay, I know what I want to do and what I want to think and mm-hmm. why, but Delane, how? And like, yes. that is okay. Let's do it. We, now we know what we're solving for. And yes we got you at, we got you on the how that's, yes. that's what we do as coaches. And as, um, you know, your support is we help you with the how. So I love it. Absolutely. I love it too. So if anybody has any questions about what you do or how to get in touch with you, where can they go? Absolutely. Um, they can go to, it's my name coaching. So it's www amy beheimer coaching.com that's a m y b as in boy e h i m as in mary e r coaching.com and i'm sure you'll put the link in the show notes as well yes 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 um and i'll also uh, share a link for the six key habits for feeling better today you know with autoimmune yes. disease so yes i, I it, it can be the end of the six key habits and there's also um a spot for you to uh take action on what you learn. So the last thing we need is more info. So it's, you're going to learn something, but then you're going to today start taking action. Uh, if you find, if you go find that those six key habits. So I love to share that and just start those little belief nuggets that, that we can do something different. I love it. I love it. Amy, thank you so much for taking time to be on the podcast. 
Um, if anybody has any questions and you have forgotten anything that's in here, you can always email me and I will get you to Amy if you need to get there. Okay. Thanks, Elaine, Amy. Thank you so much for the work you're doing. It's just, oh, it's amazing. And I'm so happy that we found each other and connected. That is so mutual. It is mutual. Thanks for coming on. Thanks. I will be back next week with another podcast.